Okay. Uh, good evening, one and good evening, one and all. I, Dr. Anjana Talukdar, on behalf of Pratiksha Academy, welcome each one of you. Um, today, the topic is case presentation, uh, interpretation of audiological findings. The speaker is Rohit Bhattacharya, and moderator is Pragya Bharadwas. Though we all know Pragya Bharadwas, but it is customary to introduce her. Uh, Pragya Bharadwas has done masters from Mysore University, and she is CEO and HOD of um, Pratidhani uh, Clinic. Uh, her area of interest is intervention audiology. So over to you, Pragya. Thank you, Anjana, ma'am, uh, for always, you know, giving us this ready platform to discuss interesting cases and interesting topics. Um, I'm very excited today to have uh, Mr. Rohit Bhattacharya. Um, he will be uh, presenting uh, some very interesting cases. He is a fellow Asian. Uh, Rohit has done his master's in uh, audiology uh, last year from Aish Mysore. And while he was waiting to start his PG internship or bond, he decided to join us. Uh, so he has been working as a consultant, consultant audiologist at Pratiksha Hospital. And he has brought a lot of uh, fresh ideas and enthusiasm into the group. And it was, a great, it was great having you in the team, Rohit. And uh, today, uh, Rohit's uh, topic of discussion is um, audiological interpretation. And it is not something very sophisticated about like electrophysiological tests or cochlear implants or things like that, but rather very uh, practical, uh, clinical uh, practice related uh, topic where uh, he's going to discuss how our interpretation of even the simplest of, uh, you know, um, audiometry or a tympanometry, uh, you know, how, how we interpret it and how we are able to contribute uh, as a team member to, you know, come to a conclusive um, diagnosis or uh, management line for a patient. So he has some very interesting cases lined up for us. And um, I hope all of us have a great session and a, a great discussion. So over to you, Rohit. Uh, you can present your screen. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Anjana, ma'am, and Pragya, ma'am, for the, all the kind words. And uh, without any delay, uh, let's start the presentation. Uh, so the topic of my presentation is uh, case studies on interpretation of different audiological findings uh, for diagnosis of simple everyday cases that we experience. <clears throat> so first, I would like to start by discussing three cases, which uh, these are like semi-hypothetical cases that uh, we uh, that we have experienced in our clinic as well as some taken from the uh, literature as well for the interest of our discussion so the all the three cases have almost similar history that is uh, they had age of 50 years gender male the first and the second case reported with the complaint of bilateral reduced hearing sensitivity tinnitus vertigo oral fullness or and autophonia. Both the first case and second case had similar case history, except the second case, uh, second case, case B, had history of uh, blood pressure as well. The third case also had similar uh, complaints, that is complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity, but, the, but it was unilateral, that is towards the right side. They, uh, he had tinnitus, fullness, autophonia, accompanied by ear pain. Okay, so uh, as we know, for a diagnosis, we have to diagnosis is based on different uh, diagnostic criteria. So case history is also one of the very important diagnostic tool, as we say, as we as we uh, know. Uh, so uh, I would like everyone to have a uh, 
have a, a direction or what they think about, by looking at the case history, what they think of the possible diagnosis. They can either type in the comment section by case one, two, three, or ABC, or they can just, uh, you can just think and uh, at, at last we'll come to a conclusion. Then the otoscopy or autoendoscopy uh, findings were, but both the first and the second cases had bilaterally intact TM and external auditory meters. But the third case, there were some fluid uh, bubbles seen in the inferior quadrants. The picture is not so clear, but, uh, but uh, there were some uh, fluid seen in the inferior quadrants. It's not very visible in the picture, but that was the findings from the autoendoscopy. Emittance was done. The first case and the second case both had bilaterally A-type tympanogram with reflexes present. The second case in the right ear, uh, the left ear was normal. In the right ear, CS type of tympanogram was obtained with reflex absent. So again, after uh, looking at the case history, the otoscopic findings and the emittance finding, I'm sure everybody is going towards a direction of a particular diagnosis. Then comes the pure tone audiometry. It was done and it was found that the first case had a, a rising type pattern in both ears with a ABG gap predominantly on the lower frequencies and had a very good bone conduction threshold that, that was at zero or even better than zero. In the second case also had a, a airborne gap which was fairly consistent in all the frequencies and had a slight dip in the dip in the uh, bone conduction thresholds at the two kilohertz region in one year and the other year was almost kind of flat and the third case that is in the right ear there was slight airborne gap in the lower frequencies uh, and uh, the airborne gap was less in the higher frequencies okay and the first two cases had moderate to uh, mild to moderate hearing loss in the both ears and the third case had uh, around a minimal to mild hearing loss in the right ear and the left ear I have not put it was normal. Speech audiometry was done and all the three cases had good uh, speech audiometry scores that was greater than 90. So looking at everything can we please uh, uh, if can anybody tell what are the diagnosis of the first case second case and the third case. So I'll make it easy. So first case had the complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity, tinnitus, vertigo, autophonia, A-type tympanogram with reflexes present. SIS was greater than 80% and uh, ABG was more at low frequency and BC was very good. It was better. So this case was diagnosed as semicircular canal dehiscence okay, or the third window syndrome. And the second case, which had a complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity, tinnitus, vertigo, and autophonia uh, with A-type tympanogram, reflexes were present, had a good speech course with ABG and a Carhartt notch in one year. This case was diagnosed as otosclerosis or ossicular fixation. The third case had a unilateral complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity, tinnitus, autophonia, accompanied by pain, had A-type tympanogram, the reflexes were absent and speech scores were uh, good, had an ABG at lower frequency with a rising pattern of audiogram, and this was diagnosed as eustachian tube dysfunction and later as medullary effusion. So the, what, what, uh, what I would like to uh, highlight here is that uh, by looking at the audiogram uh, in the first case, we may not think, we may not go in the direction that it is, it could be a, uh, a third window syndrome or a semicircular canal dehiscence because 
it is mimicking a very it is mimicking a conductive pathology but as we know that uh, uh, because the, that semicircular canal dehiscence or third window syndrome it is a inner ear pathology so we we may uh, move about our intervention in that direction i'll come to the physiology where we can uh, get get to know better why we are getting such results but again in the second case another interesting finding is that it had an here i have written a or as uh, type because of the progression but had uh, the second case had a a type tympanogram that is the it is coming in the normal range but again this was a case, but it was again diagnosed as otosclerosis after uh, after um, combining each of the diagnostic criteria then third case had a uh, third case uh, there was a uh, other debate going around the third case because it had a C, cs type of tympanogram and uh, CS type is usually associated with eustachian tube dysfunction, but uh, in this case there was fluid, but it was kind of a fluid-filled middle ear. So the uh, this uh, debate was going on that should we go for a myringotomy or not. That will come into uh, will come later uh, about the progression of the uh, emittance findings in these cases. So basically, uh, what we want to highlight from this is that we should not even if there is a typical audiogram or a typical emittance finding or a typical case history suggesting of a particular case, in this case, a conductive pathology, but we should keep our uh, minds open for a possible special or a unconventional case. So uh, these are the diagnosis, these, uh, this is supporting article regarding uh, how a conductive hearing loss could be mimicked or autosclerosis could be mimicking a superior semicircular dehiscence case. Uh, this is the possible reason. Uh, as you can see, this is a normal bony in the membranous labyrinth of the ear. So this is the pathway of the air conduction where the sound is uh, uh, traveling from the oval, uh, the because of the movement of the uh, foot plate of the stapes, the sound enters the uh, the and the movement of the oval window and the round window in equal and opposite phases. There uh, we can perceive the air conduction. Uh, but this is a case of a the semicircular uh, canal dehiscence where it is hypothesized that when the sound enters uh, and the stapes foot plate moves the energy is shunted because of the dehiscence because of the malformation the acoustic energy uh, that has been uh, transformed into the uh, fluid energy is being shunted away so because of that we are getting poorer air, air conduction thresholds and this happens especially at the lower frequencies that was evident from the audiogram similarly in case of uh, third window syndrome which will show uh, like which will mimic a conductive pathology we we are uh, we get a bc that is even beyond uh, zero zero decibels that is we can get bc around minus 10 minus 5 which which could be even better than a normal hearing person and uh, that could be because uh, here the as we know the one of the mode of conduction for bc is the compressional mode here, because of the impedance mismatch and because of the malformations that are formed, the uh, there are um, there is an extra pressure created at the especially at the lower frequency side, as you can see here. And because of that, the compression in the uh, scala tympani and the scala vestibuli is unequal. The impedance becomes low, and thus we are getting a paradoxical BC in this case. So next, uh, so next is the autosclerosis case. As we know that in autosclerosis, we are getting a Carhartt notch uh, or in, at uh, a two kilohertz notch. That is, uh, and at, at the earlier stage, but at the later stage, all the the bone conduction thresholds will be almost equal, or it will become a flat. And we, we we can get a either conductive or a mixed loss. 
so that is mostly because of the compromisation of the ossicular leg mode that is the uh, another form of bone conduction through the ossicles okay so as the stiffness increases and the uh, movement of the ossicles are fixated the uh, the the ossicular leg mode uh, is compromised and as we know the uh, the resonant frequency of the uh, ossicles are around 1.5 to 2 kilohertz so at that kilo at that particular frequency we are getting a notch initially but later when the disease disorder uh, progresses we are getting a flat bone conduction thresholds so in the third case that was the case of eustachian tube dysfunction uh, there was a, a, a confusion that should we go for a myringotomy or not because it is a common knowledge that the C type tympanogram is associated with uh, eustachian tubes, the tube dysfunction. Okay, so that, that means there is a retraction that is happening um, at the uh, at the middle ear, but it is it may not be the case always. So if uh, for a uh, so we should not be very adamant on what is the emittance finding, okay? Because the progression from eustachian tube dysfunction to medullary effusion, there is a change of the tympanometric finding or the emittance finding. At first, let's say it is a normal medullary. There we can, there we are expected to get a A type. And then when there is a negative pressure build because of the eustachian tube blockage, we can get a C type or a CS type. But also C and CS type is possible when there is fluid, uh, when there is a fluid buildup at the uh, inferior part of the quadrant. And because the fluid has not yet uh, completely uh, blocked the medullary cavity, because of uh, that, we can still get a C or CS type. And when the fluid completely blocks the medullary cavity or up to a point where the tympanic membrane movement is restricted we can get a b type and later because of medication when uh, the disease is uh, in the resolving state we are expected to get a as type and then complete recovery we can get a a type so uh, we should and also this needs to be compared with other parameters like the ear canal volume and the resonant frequency and the uh, static admittance everything to uh, to to accurately say that it is a eustachian tube dysfunction or a case of medullary fluid or a perforation or a normal medullary but it is uh, what i like to highlight is that it, if if it is a c or cs type it is not always the case that it will be a eustachian tube dysfunction and b type it is always a fluid filled medullary but even at as type or at a CS type, it could be a case of a uh, fluid filled medullary at a particular quadrant and appropriate management like myringotomy, if required, can be, uh, can be done. Uh, so uh, that ends the first three cases. So, so this is, uh, the, we'll go move to the next case before that. I would like to ask, should we recommend impedance audiometry for all the cases, except of course the contraindications. Most, uh, most of us may not recommend tympanometry or emittance for all the cases, but uh, here is a case which uh, we can take an example of uh, why the emittance finding or a baseline, baseline emittance is important during the first visit itself. So this is again a semi-hypothetical case where a 50-year-old male first reported with a complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity and tinnitus, with it, uh, which was gradually progressive. Audiometry was done and a sloping SNHL was found. This is again a typical case of presbycusis. Uh, emittance uh, was not recommended in this case. And after a few months, the case again reported back to us with a complaint, similar complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity, tinnitus, vertigo, and also autophonia. Because of uh, these complaints, uh, along with audiometry, emittance 
was also recommended. And it was found that a sloping SNHL with a slight ABG, that is the mixed component was present at some, uh, at some frequencies. Okay, and the emittance findings uh, suggested that the A type tympanogram of 0 0.5 millimoles. At the third visit, uh, the same patient reported with a similar complaint, but the, com the complaints or the problems aggravated. Here, the audiometry was done and a mixed hearing loss was uh, found with the AS type of tympanogram. That is, the stiffness has clearly been, uh, stiffness component has clearly been activated. But if the case, if the, uh, if the case, but actually in this case, emittance was done in the first visit itself. So it was found that the, in the first visit itself, it, uh, the emittance value was 1.5. That is, it is falling in the normal range. That is of A type. Okay. So in the second visit also, it was coming in the normal range only of uh, 0 0.5 and A type. But we can clearly see that there is an increase in stiffness component from 1.5 to 0 0.5. This means that the stiffness component has increased. Although in the first case, there was no significant of this emittance value, but uh, as a good uh, for a better and early diagnosis and uh, prevention or a management, if the baseline emittance is done for all the cases we even in the normal range we can suggest that there is an increase in stiffness or mass component or a decrease in stiffness or mass component based on the values so this case was of course diagnosed as uh, later diagnosed as autosclerosis but uh, we could have predicted this better if uh, but this this case was predicted uh, of autosclerosis in the second visit itself because we had a baseline tympanogram so that uh, basically uh, tells us about the importance of emittance or the importance of a baseline emittance for uh, all the cases. So again, uh, some of the misconception or policies in diagnosis and management options are uh, that is based on the emittance is that we have a conception that A type will be normal, AS type will be stiffness increase, AD type will be hyper uh, mobile TM or something. But even A, AS or AD type can come under uh, normal or can have a normal medullary or a normal tympanometry, tympanog tympanic membrane. AS type, again, it could be normal or uh, medullary effusion or ossicular fixation. AD type, again, it can be normal, it can be uh, ossicular chain discontinuity or a hypermobile TM. Similarly, for but again, we should correlate with all the other uh, values. Similarly, for B type, it could be either wax, perf perforation, rupture, or a medullary effusion, and pulsating B, B type could be a glomus jugular tumor, could indicate a glomus jugular tumor as well. Again, we have to correlate with all the other uh, values in the tympano, in the emittance, that is the ear canal volume, that is the uh, gradient, the resonant frequency, etc. For C type, again, it could be eustachian tube dysfunction, which is the case in uh, most of the uh, patients or it could be ossicular chain discontinuity in CD type or a medullary effusion in C or CS type also. So basically, the take home message from all these cases are that uh, we should not just diagnose based on one particular uh, bus, not just diagnose based on looking at the audiogram that we have seen in the first case where that it looked like a clearly conductive uh, conductive hearing loss case, but it was not. It was actually the, uh, there was actually an involvement of the middle ear. That is the semicircular canal dehiscence case. And also a baseline emittance evaluation for all the cases may help us in early diagnosis and management of different disorders. So again, that is very important.
uh, so moving on to the next case so the next case uh, was a 15 year old female who reported to us with a complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity in the left ear accompanied by ear pain who had history of measles 10 years back the nature was static with no other autological or systemic systemic history so these were the pioton audiometry results the right to ear was uh, minimal or no, almost normal hearing uh, slight minimal loss in the lower frequencies and the left ear had a, a moderately severe to severe hearing ascent hearing loss uh, with a better thresholds at 8 kilohertz uh, emittance was done and a bilateral a type tympanogram was found reflexes were present in the right ear but absent in the left ear oe was done the right ear uh, came as pass and the left ear came as referred that is obvious from the audiogram and the speech scores in the right ear it was a uh, good speech scores of 90 percent and in the left ear it was 50 percent so this uh, after uh, finding the after um, after doing all the audiological tests and uh, we suspected there could be some retrocochlear uh, involvement. So uh, this case was sent for MRI and it was found that, uh, again, the pictures may not be very clear. It was found that the, uh, the left-sided cochlea had a very small apical portion and the bilateral patulous internal auditory meters were found and there was mild hypoplasia of the left cochlea and the modulus. Okay, so so that is again very uh, evident from the audiogram also because you can see the apical uh, region, as we know, is contributing to the lower frequencies and the basal region for the higher frequencies. So there was a there was more malformation in the apical portion and less in the basal portion. That's why we we are, we were getting a better response at eight kilohertz. But again, uh, the main highlight from this case is the management option that I would like to keep it as a uh, question open for discussion later because the case is not reported to uh, reported back to us yet. This is a very recent case actually. So what are the management options for this case? Because this is a congenital hearing loss case which, uh, which was diagnosed very late, is after 15 years. So according to my opinion, uh, first, uh, definitely hearing aid could be uh, given and check the benefit. Baha and cross hearing aid uh, may not be very suitable for this scale because there is no ABG gap or the bone conduction thresholds are, uh, are not so good for Baha. Uh, and definitely this candidate is also a uh, uh, fulfills the criteria of CI candidacy, but again, uh, because the one year is normal and natural hearing uh, through for around 15 years, the acceptancy of CI may be a question. So first option, uh, in my opinion, could be hearing aid with uh, assistive listening devices, which will uh, help us in uh, difficult to hear situations. And of course, uh, this 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 could be a discussion topic where we can get to hear other opinions as well. Later. So the main take home message from this case is that for a appropriate management and diagnosis of a possible congenital hearing loss case should be uh, considered very carefully. Should uh, all the opinions of various professional as well as the case should be taken into cons consideration and more importantly the importance of early diagnosis and intervention and the importance of universal newborn hearing screening is uh, is highlighted in this case because definitely uh, uh, newborn screening was not carried out for this particular case otherwise it, it very clearly we would have able to uh, get to know at the young at the birth itself that she will she was having a unilateral uh, deafness or unilateral hearing loss 
and a possible intervention could have been started at the earlier earlier stage the next case is a 33 year old male who reported to us with a complaint of vertigo tinnitus occasional headache uh, and no reduced hearing sensitivity as such but had difficulty in hearing in noisy situation and in multi talker background the nature was static uh, and no other autological or systematic systemic history was present audiogram was done and in the right ear uh, minimal hearing loss uh, of flat type was found and in the left uh, ear almost normal hearing was found bilaterally a type tympanogram was found diagonal pattern of jagger box was found that is the uh, in the right ear the ipsi were present and in the left ear contra was present so a diagonal pattern forms in the reflex sios was done speech identification scores and in the right ear had good scores in unmasked conditions in the masked condition it was above 60% in the left ear uh, good scores were present 85 to 85% in the unmasked condition and the 70% in the masked condition oe was done bilaterally uh, pass results were uh, found so this uh, case look with like a case of a retrocochlear pathology so a uh, abr sol was done and it was found that the absolute latencies were within normal limits however the interpeak latencies were delayed that is between 1 and 3 3 and 5 and 1 and 5 these latencies were delayed so in such cases where the primary complaint is not of reduced hearing sensitivity but vertigo tinnitus occasional headache so uh, in this but in these cases we are we can suspect a retrocochlear pathology so it is very important along with the routine audiological evaluation we can go for a abr or a abr site of region testing to rule out the uh, uh, retrocochlear pathology so in such cases because oe is present and uh, abr uh, and correlating oe with abr we can either uh, rule out if it is a uh, auditory neuropathy or uh, acoustic neuroma case so this case i have not put i didn't get the uh, radiological results but this case was diagnosed as uh, acoustic neuroma case in the right ear so again uh, to, uh, so there could be a confusion between diagnosis of acoustic neuroma and ansd so there are uh, not there are some evidences uh, or some factors which we can consider in differentially diagnosing between ansd and uh, acoustic neuroma uh, that is basically from the uh, the main diagnostic criteria will be the oes and the abr uh, the oe will usually be present in case of uh, acoustic neuroma and in case of uh, ansd also it will be present and very robust but the abrs will be completely absent or cochlear microphonics could be seen in case of ansd but in case of acoustic neuroma it could be either uh, it could be present in the first peak could be present and the later peaks could be absent or the, there could be a delay in the interpeak latencies uh because most of the acoustic uh, neuromas are formed in the cp angle so that's why the first peak is usually present in such cases and the later peaks could be absent so that is one of the criteria for differentially diagnosing and there are some evidences which says that the abr site of region is a very sensitive tool in diagnosis in diagnosing small and small tumors that is lesser than even 3 or 2 mm but also there are evidences against it also so in many cases where the patient may not be very uh, keen on going for mri or the complaints may not be as severe 
so to rule out an a better cost effective test could be a abr sol or a stacked abr where we can uh, we, where we can at least suggest that there could be a retrocochlear involvement or not and these are some of the parameters that we consider that is the absolute latency interpeak latency fifth peak uh, uh, intra peak latency that is between the both the years then contralateral suppression that is uh, if there is a large tumor then we can see a contralateral suppression of the peaks so these are the some of the uh, parameters that we can consider and suggest if there is a retrocochlear pathology or not basically this is a uh, to pre uh, to avoid the mri or to uh, before suggesting an mri we can come to a the a conclusion uh, using abr as well but again this is uh, very debatable because uh, many studies says that abr sol is a very sensitive tool but again many studies says that it is against it also so again this could be open for discussion so the take home message from this case will be the abr sol could be an option before a radiological referral in suspected retrocochlear cases so these were the five cases so now we can have a discussion. Thank you, Rohit. <clears throat> I think all of the cases were very uh, interesting and um, very well explained uh, from your perspective. I just have one question for you, like in the first, uh, first set of like three cases, uh, like suppose in case uh, in the case of uh, the second uh, the third window syndrome uh, what led you to uh, like you know think in that direction that you know maybe it's not just a conductive hearing loss um, maybe there is a, a you know um, inner ear pathology involved or even in case of the uh, uh, what was the other one even in the other case um, where uh, you got a c type um where, like what led you to think that you know uh it's not like you know the just the uh, straight away the first thing that comes to your mind um what led you to think differently or was it uh you know after discussion with um, the ent uh or did you also think that you know there may be something different uh yes uh Actually, in the first, uh, for us, one of the very typical complaint of uh, uh, a semicircular canal dehiscence case is the uh, uh, Tullio's phenomenon, or uh, the patient may complain that uh, he or she may have uh, experienced the uh, sound of the eyeball moving. Okay, so the he he, can, he or she can hear the movement of the eyeball eyeballs that could be one of the very significant complaint and Tullio's phenomenon that is sound induced vertigo the mm -hmm. vert basically the the type and the mm -hmm. the duration of the vertigo and in which situation uh, are we getting the vertigo based on this case history we can uh, we can go we can think that it could be a case of semicircular canal dehiscence also uh, mm -hmm. abg at the lower frequency predominantly at the lower frequency of mm. course, that could also mimic a uh, eustachian tube dysfunction or mobiliar fluid, but a uh, very significant ABG at lower frequency and a BC, which is better, even better than zero or minus 10, minus five BC. So mm. in these cases, mm. uh, and looking at the tympanogram, which was, uh, tim sorry, looking at the otoscopy finding, which was very normal TM without any uh, mediliar effusion. So mm. combining all this, and mm. uh, excluding the possibility of uh, autosclerosis, uh, we 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 can we can uh, we can possibly think that it could also be a case of third window syndrome. But it is very it's again we need confirmation from the radiological findings also, right. which was done in this case. Uh, but uh, yeah, so in such cases, we we we, we can keep our mind open that uh, it could be such a case also. 
right so i think the uh, main the basic point is that it's not one or the other thing it's uh, we have to look at the whole picture as a whole and also our discussion with the uh, referring physician you're referring ent uh, and even other professionals i think that entire thing together yeah. is very important not just like you know doing our tests and giving our results and sending the patient back but rather having a discussion yes, uh, with the patient and is... with the referring physician right. yeah a team diagnosis is very important it could be in such in such cases right so there Pajna. are some questions Pajna. yes sir it is hard to see them this he has a bcs better and will we'll not get a better be seen ossicular fixes and that's that's the most significant thing mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. yes. yes sir that's even sir. better than zero ah, because it, because there's always always a little bit of uh, uh, lower bc in case of ossicular fixation or any kind of auto sclerosis mm -hmm. now rohit yes sir bc is very paradoxical in such cases in especially in case of uh, semicircular uh -huh. canal lesions the so, uh, so, and and also it is little bit of paradoxic and not low bc in case of ossicular fixation it may be that the other causes which may cause the bc is low in it may not the cochlear atherosclerosis but as a whole bc comes down in case of atherosclerosis can you explain it to him sorry sir i didn't get your question in case of ossicular fixation in case of atherosclerosis also yes, bc sir. little bit of low yes is yes it true? Yes, yes, sir. That is because, uh, sir, as you can see here, we, we, as we know, there are few, there are uh, actually four conduction, bone, four types of bone conduction. That is through the external layer aerial radiation, through the uh, middle layer ossicle, that is the ossicular leg mode, and the compressional and distortional mode, that is through the inner ear, and the non osseous mode, that is through the perilymph. So, in case of autosclerosis, the because of the there is a ossicular fixation stapedial fixation so the ossicular lag or the ossicular mode of bone bone conduction is compromised and the resonance of this ossicular uh, ossicles and this ossicular range is at the 2 kilohertz range so at initial stage we may find at the very init initial stage or the classical stage of autosclerosis we may find a dip in the 2 kilohertz or 1.5 kilohertz region but as the disease progresses and be, because the uh, uh, the entire um, ossicular uh, movement will be compromised later the bone conduction threshold that is through the ossicular mode will be uh, will be poorer so after the treatment the it will again come back to a better state a, a normal or better so because of this ossicular lag mode compromised we are getting a uh, paradoxical bc uh, at a later stage rohit there is a question uh, about in case number 5 i think the case of the uh, acoustic neuroma what is the importance of interoral latency uh, interoral uh, peak latency so uh, in case of very small tumor uh, the we may get the uh, because we are doing abr sol at a very high intensity that is at uh, 90 db especially in cases of small tumors with without any hearing problem so if there is no complaint of reduced hearing sensitivity and there is a case of a small tumor we may get normal uh, peaks that is one to five we may get the peaks as normal but the difference between the first peak and the third peak if there is a tumor in the cerebellofontine angle so the difference between the first and the third peak or the first and the fifth peak could could be uh, could be beyond the normal age uh, normal range that is it could be uh, the normal between the range between first and the third peak should be around uh, 2 milliseconds. If it is more than 2 milliseconds, then we can suspect that there could be some uh, some some involvement, some mass lesion in that particular region. Similarly, we can also 
uh, find out where the tumor is occurring based on the based on the interpic latency if there is a if there is no delay between uh, first and the first and the third peak but there is a difference between third and the fifth peak uh, interpic latency difference between the third and the fifth peak then we can su suggest that the tumor is in the higher part of the auditory uh, region so accordingly uh, especially in case of small tumor without any re reduced hearing sensitivity the interpic latency plays a very important role in identifying excuse more, me more, sorry excuse me can you hear me uh, rohit 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 yes sir this was speaking uh, yes, we, they are talking about interoral latency difference. interoral latency not interpic Okay, okay. Not interpreting. Interoral Consider latency of that right side. Okay. Fifth peak of the right normal. ear and fifth peak of right left ear. Okay, okay, okay. So again, sir, like, uh, um, sir, the fifth peak in uh, one ear and the fifth peak of the other ear. If it is a norm, if it is normal under, if there is a uh, normal hearing in both sides, it should be same. It should come at the same region. With a difference of uh, less than zero point five milliseconds, if, if there is the if the hearing is same, but if the hearing levels are different, then it is a different case. But in case of small tumors, this the difference where when we obtain the fifth peak in one year compared to the other year will be more, more that will that is greater Ahmad, than zero point five. Ahmad. That is greater, greater than zero point five milliseconds. More than zero point three. Yes. Zero. Okay. 0 0.5, 0 point. More than 0 0.2, that is 0 0.3, it is considered abnormal. I think it is oh. 0 0.3, right? Uh, okay, sir. Possible. Uh, okay, sir. So that, that is the significance, actually. the uh, I have read somewhere as 0 0.5, but it could be 0 0.3 also. Sir, so around 0. 0. 0. Okay, sir. So uh, if it is uh, more than 0 0.3, then we can consider suggest that uh, considered uh, a re retrocochlear lesion. Mm. Then there's another question. Uh, what audiological finding? What audiological findings suggest a retrocochlear pathology? Pragya, tell uh, the name of the person who has asked. Uh, Dr. Niteshwar sir has asked, what uh, what audiological findings suggest a, a retrocochlear pathology? Uh, so, so basically, we have to start from the case history. If the person has complained of uh, reduced hearing sensitivity, especially in noisy situation and in case of multi-talker situation, we, we can suggest, we can go towards that direction. Then specifically audiologically, the if the hearing loss is within normal range or is in minimal range, and if the reflex, if we are getting a normal A type uh, tympanogram with reflexes absent, then we can suggest, then we can think of a retrocochlear pathology. Then again, speech scores are very important in, in such cases because speech audiometry, especially the mask or uh, speech thresholds or spin. Spin scores are very important in diagnosing a retrocochlear pathology. That is the spin scores. If it is less than 60%, we consider it to be a possible case of a retrocochlear pathology. That is the neural involvement. So speech audiometry is one of the most important tool in, uh, in audiological tool in suggesting a retrocochlear pathology. Also, there are other tests like uh, tone decay and CC. But uh, other, but those are not very frequently done in our routine practice. But definitely, that could be done, and that could assess us in uh, uh, in in suggesting a RCP. But in regular practice, speech scores are very very uh, sensitive in suggesting if it is a retrocochlear pathology or not. Rohit, I'll tell you one point. Yes, sir. Please. Hello. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Please. If there is a um, main point is if there is a disproportionate reduction of speech discrimination score compared to a, compared to your hearing loss, that is very significant. 
Yes, so sir. the terminology is very important. Disproportionate reduction of speech discrimination score yes, compared yes, to your hearing loss. If you, yes. there is a hearing loss of 30 dB and you are expecting a dis discrimination score of 85% or 90%, but you are getting a discrimination score of 15 to 20%, that is very significant. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even the SRT, if we should, it should be within the plus or minus 12 dB of the pure tone average. If it is uh, less than uh, 12, 12 dB of the pure tone average of the particular year, then also we can suggest that it could be a possible case of uh, possible case of RCP. Um, uh, if if may I add, may I uh, ask one more one more question regarding this one? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Please. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. sir. We can hear you. Um, normally, speech dis discrimination score is not uh, generally normally advised uh, by 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 ENTC. So, in what audiological findings that you would suggest a uh, speech discrimination uh, uh, score should be uh, done or test should be done? Uh, actually, uh, like uh, according to uh, me uh, or. <laughs> So, uh, we should do speech for every case, speech discrimination, because it takes a short time. Uh, speech scores could be done for every case. If, if the facility is available in the audiometer or the audiometry set setup, if it is appropriate, we should do at least SRT, if not SIS, we should uh, do for every case. But if not, if not, uh, then based on the case history, based on the complaints, like if the, especially complaints of reduced hearing sensitivity in multi-talker situation, in case of uh, reduced hearing sensitivity in noisy situation, and especially complain of, I can hear the speech, but I cannot understand the speech. In such cases, we can uh, definitely, it is uh, much, very much recommended to do a speech uh, discrimination test. But if possible, if the facilities are available in the audiometer and the audiometric setup, we, we can do a speech discrimination test for all the all the cases also absolutely sir uh, actually as a gold standard speech uh, audiometry what we call a speech audiometry is should be a part of routine audiometry in all cases um, of course there are you know there may be challenges like you know based on the setup that we have and in northeast i think again the biggest challenge for a long period of time even now that we have is a proper test material some of some are developed and some are still under development. But yes, ideally, uh, even if it's not formal standard test material, even informal, uh, using informal test material, informal uh, uh, speech, we should always, always do speech audiometry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Niteshwar sir has another question about what are the differential uh, diagnosis of ascending type of SNHL audiogram, uh, ascending audiogram in uh, sensory neutral hearing loss, in what which cases can we expect? Rohit. Ascending as in rising pattern. Uh, yeah. Right, sir. Yes, absolutely, rising pattern. Yeah, uh, so it, it, it can be... Uh, uh, as we have seen one case uh, that is the semicircular canal dehiscence case there it could be a rising pattern which is not a, a conductive hearing loss actually it is a, a involvement of the inner ear then another case is of Meniere's disease where most commonly at the initial stage we will see a rising pattern of audiogram in a sensory and, and it is of course a sensory neural hearing, uh, hearing loss case then also in case of auditory neuropathy, uh, we may get uh, we miss we may see a rising pattern at the initial stage and later a flat audiogram. So and in some syndromes, I uh, don't remember right now some syndromes which uh, in case of syphilis, I think uh, which mimics a uh, um, Meniere's disease and. Uh, one more syndrome was there, I don't remember. So, it, which will mimic the Meniere's disease. So, and that, that is basically uh, uh, in the, not a conductive pathology, but that is in, uh, affecting the cochlea or the hair cells. 
so in those cases like miniers disease ansd especially in these two cases uh, involving the cochlea and the auditory nerve we may see a rising type or ascending type of audiogram another point you missed rohit it's uh, it's it's measles yes sir measles yeah. measles and syphilis i think sir syphilis one case and measles another case where do you get ascending uh, type of audiogram Yes, sir. Sir, how much is it related with the with the technology? Sorry. Sorry, sir. If if we get yeah, if we get a recently type of um, you know, audiogram, um, is it really associated with the uh, or indicative of a retrocular technology? Uh, no, we we have to correlate with everything actually, sir. Like uh, the speech course definitely, then reflexes. then uh, based on the abg the, if there is a if there is no airborne gap and it's a, a ascending type then definitely we can suggest uh, not just retrocochlear battle the then again we have to differentially diagnose based on starting from the case history like if there is a significant complaint of vertigo and tinnitus associated with reduced hearing sensitivity then we can think of the direction of a meniere's disease if the patient have any history of measles or uh syphilis as uh, bishop sir has said then again we can suggest uh, involvement of the cochlea in our rising pattern then if the person's predominant complaint is difficulty in hearing uh, speech in noisy situation and in multi talker babble situation then and uh, of course uh, we are getting a robust ways in this case in this case we can suggest uh, ansd so not just based on the pattern of audiogram but uh, based on the based on everything we can also take the help of vamps uh, in such cases if we are having uh, doubt regarding meniere's disease because that also helps us in uh, uh, accurately di diagnosis so of course we can get a indication from the pattern of audiogram but also we have to look at the entire test battery before we say that it is a particular case of uh, rcp or a cp or a conductive hearing loss Thank you, thank you, Rajesh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very well explained, Rohit. Are there any other questions? Rohit, is there any specific test that you can confirm Meniere's disease audiologically? uh audiologically sir uh yes sir there are like uh, in abr there is something called as cochlear hydrops uh, masking paradigm champs one test is there uh, that is a the kind of a stack abr only that is done with one particular uh filter setting and there is also glycerol test we can do uh, uh of course with 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 knowing the case history of the patient if there is diabetes and all we we, we it is usually not suggested uh then a uh, vamps are there so champ champ that is the cochlear hydrops uh, masking uh, paradigm that abr vamp then glycerol test these are usually most common which we can administer uh, 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 till what um, your uh, period sorry sir i can't hear you so, sir uh, couldn't hear you sir now its voice is coming yeah but can you tell me in the what period like like uh, one year two year three years duration four years five years till what duration your A glycerol test can give you positive results. Um, that I am not so sure, sir. But I think at the mostly at the initial stage only, sir. It is, uh, or at the later stage, I think, sir. It is more common. No, no. The, it is still till it is still five years that it, it gives you some okay, information. Sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Rohit, hello, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. 
So what is serviceable hearing? You have mentioned regarding the SPs and uh, discrimination is corona in relation to CP angle tumor, vestibular sonoma. Can you explain it? Sorry, sir. Can you? What is serviceable hearing? Sir, uh, serviceable hearing, sir. Is it same as residual hearing, sir? I am not getting. Nita, sir. Sir. Nita, sir, are you here? Nita, sir. Yes, sir, I'm here. I'm here, sir. What is serviceable hearing for the vestibular sonoma approach? Sorry, I'm directly <laughs> with you. Sir, the best person is you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exactly sure of the figures. Sir, please, sir. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why they, everybody is the speech discrimination is cruel now. It's very much a, important. Uh, it's, uh, hello? Yes, I think around 50%. Uh, yeah, yeah, you are absolutely better. right. 50, uh, 50 to 70, I think. Speech discrimination uh, score is 50 to 70%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So American Hearing Association, it is a approach for the CP angle, actually vestibular sonoma. Okay. So up to class, they have a four class, class A, class B, class C, and class D. Class B is a serviceable hearing. Class A is a good hearing. Class A is a good hearing. Hmm. That means it's a good hearing. Class B is a serviceable hearing. Class C is a measurable, miserable, and class D is a dead ear. So A is a normal, D is a dead ear. So only thing the B is a serviceable hearing. Okay. So the parameters of our serviceable hearing, pure tone threshold is 50 dB and SDS is 60 to 50 to 69. Can I repeat again? SDS is 50 to 69. So why it is important? It is important because to if we the patient have a still a serviceable hearing, the approach is not translab because he has still the hearing. So you have to choose the other option for uh, the approach to the CP angle. So this is the important, along with the Puritan thresholds, this importance of the speech discrimination score in case of the retrocochlear pathology, especially for vestibular cinema. Thank you. Am I right, Nita, sir? Absolutely, absolutely, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Do you know how to operate the case? Hello? Do you know how to operate the case? <laughs> if you find that SDS is such and your your term threshold is 50. Yeah. Suppose I eat but you have to show the different size of the tumor by the imaging imaging. I love the amazing side. That's why the hearing threshold and speech discrimination score is very much important. Important. It is slow going to your tumor again. You can wait also. Yeah, yeah, sir. But you have to think like that of the possibility of morbidity also. Mm. The facial palsy and cosmetic deformation. There are many things actually uh, difficult to say. With just one other question, the uh, importance of supra threshold ref reflex decay. Dr. Uh, 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 Mukherjee sir, sir, Mukherjee sir has asked importance of supra threshold reflex decay. And um, sir, I could not get the other word that you have written. That was de recruitment. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sir. Got it. Rohit. De recruitment. Okay. Yes, sir. De recruitment, sir. Uh... In case of uh, ABLB test, sir, are you asking? Yes. Sir, like in case of RCP, again, sir, ABLB test, we are uh, we don't uh, practically use so much because of the, uh, the procedural and the instructional difficulty. But again, sir, de recruitment is an indication of retrocochlear pathology. Uh, uh, so also the supra threshold. Yes, sir. Supra threshold. That Reflex decay. This is also important. Yes, sir. Reflex decay test or the supra threshold uh, stat test is there. One call. It is called as uh, supra threshold uh, stat. Uh, test. Yes. Uh, so 
these two again reflex decay test we can be sure that if the reflex that we are getting is it a artifacts or actual reflex through reflex ah. decay we can con uh, confirm that and through the supra threshold uh, reflex decay test or supra supra threshold tone test also uh, that ah. is presented at 110 db uh, yeah. e e even with with that we can uh, if there is a decay uh, before uh, say 5 seconds if you are giving a 10 yes. second period there, if there is a decay before that, we can we can suspect the RCP as well. Ah. Rohit, Rohit. Moreover, you have told rightly the stack ABR is important. Uh, stack yeah. ABR, compressed ABR, because yeah, yes. uh, there is a uh, timing from the apex to the uh, yes. yeah, center as a cochlear nucleus, as well as from the base to the cochlear nucleus. There's a timing difference. So yes, if sir. you give stack DPR, then also you can find out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Stack, Rohit, Rohit, yes, sir. Is yes, sir. Rohit, yes, sir. We yes, have sir. to, for the, for the viewer, you have to say what is recruitment and what is decruitment. Uh, 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 sir, uh, recruitment is uh, abnormal, uh, abnormal increase of loudness. That is usually- Partition of loudness, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Comparing sir, like, both the years. Comparing both the years, sir. Like it yes. is usually seen in case of uh, cochlear uh, cochlear pathologies, yes. uh, in case of Meniere's disease or uh, NIHL. That at a mm -hmm. lower level, both for the right ear. Suppose one year there is a CP. So in the uh, at the lower level, the thresholds, the tolerable thresholds will be same. But as the threshold as, as we increase the intensity, the tolerable thresholds of the poorer ear will be yes. less. So basically the less. that indicates recruitment. Yes, sir. That will indicate recruitment and that uh, the dynamic range will will be reduced in such cases. But in right. case of retrocochlear pathology, because of the faster adaptation of the nerve, the yes. this this phenomenon doesn't happen, but a reverse phenomenon happen that reverse happen. Higher, that is the recruitment. Yeah. Yes, sir. That is at a higher intensity, the uh, instead of uh, better tolerance, uh, better uh, hearing sensitivity, the sensitivity will yeah. uh, rather decrease at a higher intensity. Correct. So, so recruitment is defined as abnormal slow growth of loudness. Yes, yes, yes. 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 And recruitment is defined as abnormal rapid growth of loudness yes. with the yes. increase in intensity of sound. That is the exact definition. Yes. Given yes. by Fowler. No, this was given by Fowler. Yes, yes, Fowler. Fowler is the key man. Yeah. Decrease of this. So, Pagi, I think there is no more questions. Yeah, I think. Can so. conclude the sessions on the video. It is a very good presentation by the presenter. It is really good. And good discussion also. <laughs> Thank you, Mukhaji, sir. Uh, but uh, the audio Tiruvur presented, uh, I've never heard his name, but he's from ICE, that is good, from Mysore. But discussion is very good. He said he should continue a series of different cases, particularly in mixed hearing loss. That is the most confusing type. You have no one can answer. Uh, and uh, to the audio should always have a discussion of the referring physician. That is most important. Otherwise, the physician will be more confused because he has got a lot of to do and patient's expectation is more. And yes. treatment. That is very important. Only giving a report is nothing. But to giving a treatment and giving a judgment and giving a good solution, good counseling, is important. Correct. Fukon sir, all these cases he has presented today is a, he's a experience and last. Um, it's not from the books actually. Not he's not referred to cases from the books. So the last few months uh, we have the experience in our studio experience. Yes. What the cases he has put now for the discussion? All the cases we uh, from the during the, his last uh, tenure of during our studio actually. Okay. Uh, how many did it? One year. Sir? 
Your voice is breaking, actually. Vishwaji, Vishwaji, yeah, sir. Sir. We should discuss more. More frequently, <laughs> it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir. I mean, it's bad. The Ruit, Ruit, Ruit is very good. Ruit, more. Discuss more. We have one word from me, actually. Stop sharing. Ruit, yeah. stop Sorry. sharing. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, very nice presentation. That's okay. But a difficult part for a lot of physicians. You can tell many things, particularly your third window problem and your these things, your equipment, your equipment. But very difficult, and there is no solution also. Much. That is the main problem to give to the patient. So that's why you need a good audiologist actually in the team actually. Clinical team. Yes, 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 we are, we are, yeah, man, we are lucky that Louis is a seriously is a brilliant guy. I have seen. This is agree that yes, myingotomy. They don't do not come to do myingotomy. In the literature, it always three months wait is necessary. But people do, but that is not the classic. A little effusion with B type um, fluctuating B type curve, but you should not do myingotomy. There are good solutions. Some solutions are there. And patient ultimately after some days he gave very good result. And then if you are smiling to me, the patient will come to me and, and I will come to go to someone. Because if you have to persist and they to Google also, there is something you see and how many you have to wait, how what treatment you have to give. Therefore, patient does not want that one. Therefore, it's very important manning to me that question in that case does not come. Yes, we should always better go with the conservative first. Uh, and nowadays, uh, lots of option for other um, like uh, uh, this conservative good these things, and also important to have a uh, this uh, sinus pathology and as a phrasal pathology should be also ruled out before yes. going. I not to with a put a grammar will not the solution. Yeah, yeah. Thank you sir. Thank you. On the way you can conclude. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Very interesting cases and discussions. Uh, thank you, Pragya, for excellent moderation. And thank you, Rohit, for your excellent uh, presentation, throwing light in our day-to-day -day practices. And I second uh, Pragya and all, sir, uh, comment on your innov innovative ideas and expert input in reporting audiological investigation in our practices. So my sincere thanks to all the viewers and my special thanks to Dr. S.B. Fukan sir, Mukherjee sir, and Nitesar Singh from Manipur who had joined us uh, to make the successful session. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night. Thank, good. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Good. And good night. Good night. Good night.